brain-eating parasites are taking over your town, but the one that infects you gets stuck in your hand instead. The film begins with a brief monologue on the overconsumption of mankind. It ends on a salient question. If the human population were halved, would the amount of forest burned also be halved? We see some strange creatures washing up on shore before cutting to one entering a man's ear in his sleep. He awakens momentarily, but slips back into the night as if nothing happened. We see the same fate nearly fall upon a high school boy, Sinji. Fortunately, he's saved by his earphones. The parasite attempts to make passage through his nose, but is quickly thwarted by a sneeze. Sinji springs into action, but the parasite is much too quick. It leaps into his hand and crawls up through his skin. Though, he's able to halt its ascent by tying his earphones around his arm like a tourniquet. His mother hears the commotion and proceeds to calm him down. She thinks the crazy music he was listening to gave him a bad dream. Moms, huh? The next morning, Sinji's hand is acting up, but he doesn't make much of it. Meanwhile, the man that was infected last night examines himself in the mirror. He proceeds to slowly walk up on his wife with a blank expression. She looks upon him with confusion before his face splits open into a horrifying creature. During his walk to school, Sinji talks to his love interest, Satomi. Suddenly, his hand assumes a mind of its own and starts to feel up her face, and her… goods. She reacts as you'd expect, and what is Sinji supposed to say? My hand is possessed? Yeah, right. While in class, he drops an eraser, and when he can't reach it, his hand elongates. Later at home, Sinji investigates the cause of his symptoms before his hand briefly sprouts an eye. He takes a knife to it, when suddenly, it transforms into a snake-like creature. After recoiling in fear, Sinji watches as the creature morphs into a little guy with hands. The creature exclaims that it failed. It doesn't know what it or Sinji is, but it does know that it was supposed to eat his brain. Instead, it became his right-hand man. Okay, I'll stop. The next morning, we see the creature voraciously consuming information. Having failed its main mission, the creature expresses its feeling of being wrapped in despair. Hey, that's my line, Sinji replies. They head to the school library where the creature continues its studies. It christens itself Migi, meaning right hand. Love that. Sinji takes him to watch some sword fighting and then archery. Migi is greatly intrigued. Later, Sinji attends a painting class when Satomi confronts him about what happened earlier. She threatens to make him… not alive. Another classmate teases him about his painting, saying it looks a lot like Satomi. Back at home, Miki asks him if he'd like to mate with that girl. The ever-inquisitive Miki begins to inspect Sinji's snake, for research purposes, of course. <laughs> we see a few more murders take place as the parasites spread. Brutal. Sometime later, Sinji is riding a bus home when Miki abruptly requests to get off. Upon exiting, he tells Sinji that he can sense another one of his kind just 200 meters away. He's anxious to know what he was supposed to become, so he forces Sinji to find out. The pair finds themselves at a meat shop. When they enter, they stumble upon a creature devouring what remains of a man. Sinji can't help but be revolted, which prompts the creature to notice him. It detects one of his own, but Migi explains that the original host, Sinji, is still intact. Suddenly, Migi senses killing intent and instructs Sinji to run, but there's nowhere to go. The creature then reasons with Migi, offering to share his body with him. He chops off his hand and Migi carefully considers his options. The creature becomes impatient and strikes at Sinji. Migi blocks and a battle breaks out. Migi quickly claims victory, owing his success to the sword fights he watched. Sinji thanks him, but Migi explains that he was only looking out for himself. Switching bodies would have been too risky. Sinji meets up with his mom and she voices concerns about him. As she holds onto him, we notice some scars on her hand. Sinji pulls away and tells her that school's simply been stressing him out. Before bed, Sinji and Migi watch some news about the parasite murders. Sinji really wants to talk to his mom about what's really going on, but Migi objects. Though he doesn't control his brain, he has other ways of keeping him quiet. Sinji calls him a demon, then goes to sleep. Migi takes a moment to reflect on this word, demon. We return to the meat shop where a crime scene has been established. A detective, Hiruma, examines the scene, noting the presence of a man-eating person that isn't quite human. The following morning, Sinji awakens to Migi researching about demons. Turns out, humans are what's closest to them. Ha! <laughs> Cheeky. The pair arrive at school and are informed that due to an accident with one of the teachers, a substitute, Ryoko, has been brought in. Migi senses the presence of one of his kind, and you guessed it, it's her. The trio locks eyes in mutual understanding. Immediately after, a nervous Sinchi confronts her, though he keeps his distance in case the fight breaks out. She can sense his heart pounding and tells him not to worry, as Migi would be able to sense her killing a tent if there was any. Ryoko tells him she wants to live a normal life and invites him to talk more after school. Sinchi isn't a fan of the idea, but Migi insists. He's surprised that she's living like a human and wishes to learn more. The trio meet up at an aquarium when Miki senses the presence of two more quickly approaching parasites. Ryoko introduces them. There's Hideo, a smiley high school kid, and a sour-faced officer who wishes not to be named. Ryoko instead refers to him as Mr. A. She explains that in order to survive, they formed an alliance. She'd like Sinchi and Miki to join. Considering he's human, Sinchi is confused. 
Ryoko shares that she conducted an experiment with Mr. A. They got it on, and as a result, she became pregnant. Though they are monsters, the resulting baby would still be human. This raises the question, what are they exactly? Since she's forced to join them, since Ryoko is basically holding the school hostage. In fact, she can kill a whole classroom within three seconds. We later see the parasites in their secret hideout. Hideo and Mr. A enjoy a meal, while Ryoko tests to see how long she can go without eating humans. It displeased Mr. A questions if she really intends on having Shinji join them. She believes him and Miki to be ideal research subjects for better learning how humans think. Meanwhile, Shinji eats with his mother, who senses he's hiding something. He gets up and turns his back to her, to which she reaches out in an attempt to comfort him. We once again take notice of her scars, and Shinji pulls away, telling her he's not a child anymore. Later on, he visits the school alone and paints the same figure from earlier. Migi realizes that rather than Satomi, the painting is of his mother. Migi asks about her. Considering she's the one feeding them, he deems her important. Since she shares that as a child, his mother saved him from scorching out oil by getting in the way. He feels immense guilt over this. Migi reflects on the human quality of self-sacrifice, something he doesn't quite understand. On the way home, the pair run into Mr. A. Migi senses tremendous killing intent and quickly hatches a plan. Since she runs away to somewhere more private, and Mr. A follows along. Miki questions his intent to kill one of his own, but Mr. A shares that he knows about what happened in the meat shop. He only knows one creature that can kill like that. As Mr. A prepares to strike, Miki tells Shinji that the outcome depends on him. A battle commences, and the parasites trade slashing strikes while Shinji cowers in fear. Miki calls for him to take action, and he slowly inches forward. The desperation in Miki's voice grows before Shinji finally summons the courage to land the finishing strike. He stabs Mr. A with a pipe, turning him into a living faucet. As he collapses, Miki tells him that his biggest mistake was underestimating a human. The pair head back home, leaving Mr. A to bleed out, though he manages to stop the bleeding. As fate would have it, Shinji's mother was shopping at a nearby market. During her return home, she comes across Mr. A in a pool of his own blood. Naturally, she goes to help him. However, no good deed goes unpunished. Back at home, Miki awakens Shinji and warns him of another incoming threat. The pair head downstairs as it closes in. The figure looms by the door, then unlocks it. Oh, it's his mom, right? Shinji! Having just had his heart pierced, Shinji collapses. Mr. A claims victory and leaves Miki to perish with the dying boy. Though, he has other plans. Miki enters Shinji's body and gets to work. Fortunately, the anatomy lessons paid off and he manages to repair him. Since she inspects his body to find the holes been patched up, Miki awakens, delighted at the miracle before his eyes. He explains that he used pieces of himself to seal the hole. Since she heads off to school and runs into a concerned Satomi, she asks where he's been, but he doesn't respond. She presses, but he tells her to stop following him and runs off. Since she storms into Ryoko's lab and demands to know where Mr. A is, but she refuses to share. Miki explains what happened, and Ryoko puts the final pieces together, realizing that Miki must have repaired him. She goes on to explain that Mr. A possesses a dangerous personality, and she had them meet as an experiment. This prompts a furious Sinchi to whip out a knife. Ryoko commends him on his bravery and closes in, but ultimately chooses not to strike. Instead, she comments on the fact that something's different about him. He's changing. We cut to the police station where Detective Hirama is informed that the fingerprints recovered from the iron pipe are the same ones that were found in the meat shop. The assistant also mentions that once again, human remains were found in the victim's stomach. The assistant remarks that the rumors must be true. Parasites are taking over the populace. Hirama warns him to tread carefully, or else the higher-ups will put a stop to this investigation. Sometime later, Shinji walks home when suddenly, Miki senses the presence of multiple parasites. He looks up to find a crowd gathered around an up-and-coming politician, Takeshi. Shinji joins in and realizes, it's the man on the stand. Afterwards, and back at home, Miki is delighted to learn that one of his very own is posing as a politician. The prospect of parasites taking over the world excites him immensely. Suddenly, they hear a knock on the door. It's Detective Hirama and his partner. They briefly question Shinji about the murder that took place near his home. He sweats profusely as just behind his back, Miki is ready to strike. Fortunately, it doesn't come to that and the men see their way out. The following day at school, Satomi reaches out once more to a cold Shinji. She's heard the news that his mother is missing and extends her condolences. All of a sudden, Hideo walks up and greets the pair before Satomi introduces him as the school's newest transfer student. Shinji stares him down and questions why he's here. Satomi lightens up the mood and makes them shake hands. We proceed with the greatest fight scene of the movie as Hideo and Shinji test the might of their grips. <laughs> Hideo walks off and Satomi asks, what the hell was that? To which Shinji replies, <laughs> I was only testing his power. Satomi is swept away by a friend and we learn that Ryoko was watching the entire time. Later, Ryoko talks with Hideo and reflects on the fact that Shinji is growing stronger. Hideo now understands why she wishes to study him. At home, Miki explains that due to his life-saving intervention, Shinji's cells have become forever altered. Shinji wishes to head out in search of Mr. A, which prompts Miki to note that along with his body, Shinji's personality is changing too. 
he shares that saving him came at a cost. Migi now has to sleep four hours a day. That doesn't seem like a big deal, until he mentions that he can't be woken up during that time either, and it happens randomly. During that time, he's effectively dead. What? What? Meanwhile at the police station, Detective Hiram and his partner discover through a forum that pulling a parasite's hair causes it to curl up. Oh, thank God. At the hideout, the parasites discuss the news that their kind can be detected through such a simple test. Ryoko worries about their future, but Takeshi assures her that once elected, the town will become a safe haven for their kind. The following day, Shinji hangs out with Satomi after class. She offers to cook him dinner, so they go shopping. They have a good time, and she's glad to see that the Shinji she knew is still there. Upon exiting the store, Shinji notices a dying dog on the road. He walks through traffic to save it, but it's too late. To Satomi's shock, he disposes of the dog in the trash, calling it garbage. She's horrified, and wonders how he doesn't pity the animal. He coldly explains that the dog is now merely flesh and bones. She rejects his philosophy and runs off. A confused Shinji turns to Migi for guidance, who explains that that was something he would have said. On Ryoko's end of things, she's confronted by the school staff who notice she's pregnant. We cut to her returning home, where she sees that her front door is already unlocked. Her parents await her. They apologize for barging in, but were concerned after learning that she suddenly quit teaching. To their dismay, they find that the rumors are true. She's pregnant. Ryoko remains silent and her mother inexplicably realizes that she's not Ryoko. She begins to panic and pleads with her husband to call the cops. As they argue, Ryoko strikes. She briefly hesitates before offering the same fate to her mother. Afterwards, she carefully inspects her face in the mirror. Shinji meets with her the next day and learns that in her absence, Hideo will be looking over him. Like Ryoko, Hideo rarely eats humans. She's hopeful that this will be the solution to the parasite problem. Meanwhile, Hideo is posing for the art class. One girl knows that he has such a peculiar style. It's like he's not even human. She playfully plucks a strand of his hair and says she's just kidding. Uh-oh, I guess she's not. Why do you have to go and do that, says Hideo. He counts up the students and when one attempts to flee, unveils his true form. Ryoko and Sinchi overhear the screaming students and Sinchi heads out. Hideo promises to make things painless, as long as they don't move. Satomi snatches a bottle of paint remover and tosses it at him. He quickly slashes it away, but the bottle's contents reach its mark nonetheless. Hideo's tentacles shrivel up and he blindly lashes out in pain. Shinji hurriedly runs up the stairs against the flow of fleeing students. Upon arriving to the scene, he finds a hallway littered with mangled corpses. Panic sets in as he realizes that the butchered bodies before him are his classmates. As he hyperventilates, Miki calms him down. His breathing slowly normalizes and his broken expression is replaced with one of determination. Up ahead, Hideo stalks the halls in search of Satomi, who's hiding in a locker. He senses her and she narrowly avoids his strike. Before he can land the finishing blow, Shinji arrives to save the day. Well, actually, Miki deserves the credit here. Just look at those moves. Ryoko pulls up and expresses her disappointment in her comrade. He begs for help, explaining that the chemical attack has rendered him unable to morph his face. In response, she rolls a homemade bomb towards Hideo. After grabbing Satomi, Shinji hops out the window and guides her to safety. Shortly after, police storm the building but are no match for Hideo's dexterous tentacle blades. Meanwhile, Miki informs Shinji that he can still sense Hideo's killing intent. Shinji arms himself, then climbs up an opposing building. He has a nice vantage point of the school, but it's awfully far away. No ordinary human could make the shot, but Shinji is no longer just a man. Nice. Ryoko joins him on the rooftop. Shinji remarks that he should have killed them both when he first met them. However, Ryoko reminds him that that would mean killing her human child as well. Miki chimes in, inquiring as to what she'll do with the child. Experiments, Ryoko replies. Shinji abhors this, but she further clarifies her intent. Mothers are a strange breed of humans, and she wishes to learn firsthand where their strength comes from. Before departing, she leaves Shinji with Mr. A's location. Later at night, Detective Hiram examines the crime scene, taking keen interest in the impact left by Shinji's attack. He looks off towards the opposing building and wonders who, or what, left it. The next day, Shinji seeks out Mr. A, and the pair head off to battle under a bridge. Just before the fight commences, Miki gets sleepy, though he's able to morph into a sick blade before catching some Z's. To Mr. A's surprise, Shinji is able to hold his own against him. His enhanced physical abilities quickly lead to him gaining the upper hand. In a last ditch effort, Mr. A disguises himself back into Shinji's mom. He speaks kindly to him, causing a moment of hesitation. He capitalizes on the slaps in judgment and fires a piercing attack, but for some reason, it misses. We see that the strike was diverted by a hand, his mother's hand. In fact, the same hand that saved him as a child. Now that's poetic. The movie wraps up with Takeshi winning the election, the beginnings of the human life protection operation, and someone snapping photos of Shinji and Miki during his hospital visit with Satomi. Oh, and we get a tease of this guy, Goto. He shares with the other parasites that a powerful commanding force resides within him. 
a force that urges him to kill humanity. The rampage of man-eating parasites continues as one of their own fights to stop them. The film opens with the police utilizing a man, Yurigami, who has the uncanny ability to differentiate between humans and monsters. The monsters are people that were infected by brain-eating, shape-shifting parasites. Yurigami is a bit of a rascal. He gets very excited to see a woman placed in front of him, and very upset when he gets an old one. Honestly, I get that. Detective Hiromi quickly grows skeptical of the man. So, Yurigami clues them in on his backstory. He's a fiend and a delinquent who gets off on assaulting women, which he believes is the reason for his monster detecting abilities. Suddenly, our protagonist, Shinji, enters the room. Yurigami senses something and his tone quickly becomes serious. He has Shinji look forward to reveal his face. Never mind, he's human. Weird. You see, Shinji was attacked by one of these parasites, Migi, but trapped it in his arm. Now, while most of us use our right hand as a girlfriend, Shinji uses his as a living weapon. Also, during a near-death experience, Migi repaired him with his cells, leaving him more powerful but cold, just like the parasites. In other words, he's a hybrid. Sometime later, Shinji's walking around when Migi senses a nearby parasite. They find a building, and apparently, Migi's leveled up his lockpicking skill. They find the creature feasting on a human, then Shinji takes action. He has Migi play defense while he rushes in and literally punches a hole through this man's chest. We see that another man is near the scene, clutching a camera. Afterwards, Shinji and Migi cook. Oh, I see he's also put some skill points into cooking. Very nice. Shinji mentions that he feels like someone's been following them, but Migi can only detect his own kind, not humans. The parasites meet up. Takeshi, who is also the mayor, mentions the ongoing killings being carried out by Shinji. Their leader, Tamiya, has given birth to a human baby, which was one of her many experiments from the last film. She urges the others not to take action against Shinji and Migi, as she believes them to be their greatest hope for survival. Having lost his mother in the first film, he's merely lashing out. We cut to a parasite enjoying a walk. <laughs> hmm, he's a peculiar one. And powerful. Turns out, this is a Yakuza hideout. He storms in and butchers everyone inside. Sometime later, Takeshi visits Goto, another powerful parasite, and commends him on a successful training session against the Yakuza. That was Miki, Goto says. They discuss Sinchi, with Goto concluding that he's a threat that should be taken care of. Tamiya meets with Kuramori, the photographer that's been stalking Sinji. As a journalist, he feels compelled to go public with the story, but Tamiya urges him to stay silent. Though, he needs some convincing. I just want to keep up our relationship, Tamiya says. Oh, he's a simp. Kuramori plays peekaboo with Tamiya's son, then heads home to greet his own daughter. He shares with her that soon, she'll be able to meet her new mom, referring to Tamiya. Oh boy, we cut to Satori, Sinchi's love interest who's mourning the deaths of her classmates, who were butchered in the last film. Sinji pulls up behind her and advises her to just move on and forget about it. How could you say that? The Sinji I knew would never, Satori says. But Sinji just stands there and exudes strong Sigma male energy. Later on, Kuramori is hot on Sinji's trail, but is caught dead in his tracks. Miki reasons they ought to kill him, but Sinji convinces him otherwise. The trio heads home where Kuramori shows them the pictures he took. The pair reveal Tamiya's true nature to an incredulous Kuramori. To prove it to him, Sinji meets with Tamiya while wearing a wire. He warns her not to involve humans, but she tells him to mind his own business. Just be patient, she says. More and more, my kind are transitioning away from eating humans. Just trust me, and I'll guarantee your safety. Sinji returns to a shook in Kuramori. He advises him to keep his distance, then heads out. Kuramori decides otherwise, and is instead more driven than ever to dig into the case. Wanting to learn how deep the problem lies, Kuramori meets with the mayor to discuss a story he's writing on the parasites. After he leaves, they find that he planted a recording device. We can't have that. The mayor orders him to be killed, stating that they must eliminate all threats. And as far as Tamiya, she ain't gotta know. Later in the day, Satori walks Sinchi home. She apologizes for perhaps being insensitive about his apathetic disposition. He did lose his mother after all. Though, he giggles and assures her that he doesn't think about it at all. Cold. Things take a turn for the series, and he does reveal that while he wants to cry, he can't. He doesn't know who or what he is anymore. At night, Sinchi is out when Miki senses the presence of five quickly approaching parasites. They run but soon realize a fight is inevitable. A single person appears. It's Miki. Apparently, he's got parasites in his arms and legs too. <laughs> Naturally, Sinji runs. Though, during the chase, Miki notes that he's rather uncoordinated. He reasons that they might have the upper hand with their superior speed. The pair leap into action and deliver a slicing blow. Now, just to finish him off. Damn, never mind. The pair run off and Miki's right arm slithers off and onto his head. Whoa, it's Goto. Miki crawls back towards the body, this time becoming its right hand. That's a much better place for you, Goto notes. We cut to Kuramori, exiting a market. As he heads home, he spots cops surrounding his building. Realizing what this might mean, he dashes up the building and storms into his apartment. He finds her, dead. Ah! 
The cops question him, but he refuses to answer, instead offering up a blank expression. Though, behind that emotionless exterior lies the burning rage of a thousand sons. Tamiya meets with the others and chastises them for killing Kuromori's daughter. Takeshi speaks up, stating that they ought to eliminate all their threats, including Shinji and Migi. She sternly warns them not to take humans so lightly, since they don't fully understand them yet. Unlike parasites, humans are not solely interested in self-preservation. They care about others and work together in the hundreds, thousands, and even millions. In numbers, humans form a powerful superorganism. Before heading out, she cautions them not to act alone again, as the fate of their species depends on it. Takeshi laughs as she departs. The others ask him what to do next, and he gives them that look. At her home, Tamiya breastfeeds her baby, then plays peekaboo. She notes the baby's laughter and practices the expression in the mirror. <laughs> Suddenly, she senses something and heads out. She's being trailed by three others. They corner her. The humans call this a coup d'etat, she says. If you guys intended on killing me, why did you only send three? Nani? <laughs> Tamiya launches a discreet split attack. It's highly effective. The three pieces slither back and reform into her face. Creepy, but cool. Meanwhile at the police station, Koromori has escaped custody. Tamiya returns home and finds that her son is gone. In his place lies a note telling her to meet him at the park tomorrow. We cut to Koromori at the park with her son. He calls Detective Hirama and tells him he's gonna have his revenge. They trace the call and start heading out to the park, but you can bet they're gonna take their sweet time. Simultaneously, the feds are preparing a raid on the mayor's building. Back to Tamiya, we see her searching for Sinji, but she runs into Satori instead. She gives her Sinji's number. To his surprise, she calls in. You sent that monster to kill me, now you want to talk? Sinji says. She reveals that while Goto is indeed one of her experiments, it was not her who sent him. Tamiya tells Sinji to come for a date at the park. She has something to show him. At the same time, the feds have begun a seek and destroy mission. People are lined up and sent through an x-ray. Oh, there's one. They corner it, then send it to a better place. Hmm, do parasites go to heaven? At the park, Tamiya confronts Kuromori, who's holding her son hostage. She explains that she wasn't the one behind the death of his daughter, but he doesn't buy it. She slowly tiptoes forward, but this only aggravates him. He holds the baby towards the edge of a drop, though Sinji arrives and his pleas cause Koromori to hesitate. Tamiya proceeds to open up about the true nature of parasites. We are weak creatures. Without humans, we can't even survive. We cut back to the feds, who have stormed the building in search of fleeing parasites. One by one, the monsters are put down with haste. Tamiya's words have become manifest. Tormenting each other is pointless. The only path forward is coexistence. Parasites and humans living together in harmony, just like Sinji and Migi. Their jointure represents her hope. The cops finally arrive, prompting Kuromori to take action. However, he is struck down and the baby is carefully retrieved by its protective mother. These actions shock Migi. Why would she save the child? Why care? Tamiya states she even shocked herself. She now understands the mysterious nature of mothers. She inches forward with the baby in hand, offering it up to Sinji. Detective Hirama commands her to stop or he'll shoot. Hmm, tasty. Her display of power frightens the other cops. So anyway, they start blasting. Tamiya prioritizes the baby, shielding it with her hair as the bullets enter her vulnerable human body. Before she collapses, she hands off the baby to Sinji. He holds the baby and tells it, your mother died protecting you. This triggers a flashback of his own mother and Sinji is finally able to cry. Satori arrives and upon seeing a somber Sinji, embraces him lovingly. Meanwhile, the feds have now cornered the mayor. He proceeds to give them an impromptu speech about the horrors of humanity. Are the parasites really the monsters? Humans, with all their greed and gluttony, have devoured the earth and decimated countless species. Perhaps, they are the real monsters. The captain's heard enough and orders the squad to fire. Upon inspecting his body, they find out he was human all along. Urugami erupts in laughter, confirming it to be true. Suddenly, he's overwhelmed by fear. He turns around to see Goto, standing menacingly. The cops fire at him, but he counters with a shield. Phew, <laughs> they're not ready for this smoke. As things conclude at the park, Sinji is about to be brought in for questioning. Though, the detective receives the grim news that the anti-parasite squad has been wiped out. Sinji and the police pull up to find a triumphant Goto standing tall before he jumps down to greet them. Detective Hirma has Sinji run away while he defends him, blocked. Unfortunately, that spells the end for our dear detective. With the help of Mingi, Sinji hijacks a car, but Goto's got a similar idea. A high-speed chase ensues before Goto leaps onto the car and starts slicing away at Sinji. Come on, Goto. Mingi's an easy target here. Anyway, the car crashes, but Mingi pulls Sinji to safety just in time. Following the explosion, we see Goto shrug off the damage. The pair runs into the woods while Mingi hatches a last-ditch plan. They might be able to take advantage of the fact that Goto can only sense his own kind. Mingi separates and lurks in the trees, waiting for the right moment. There it is. Sinji falls up from the flank, but Goto has already recovered. Sinji can do no more than watch as Mingi lays his life on the line for him. Run, Sinji. We don't both have to die. Rip. I'ma miss that little guy. Sinji flees before taking refuge in a landfill. 
Satori calls him up and meets him there. She cares for his wound and empties his nut. The next morning, he feels something in what remains of his arm before what remains of Mingi sprouts an eye. Wait, this means Goto can probably sense him. There he is, causing trouble. Satori begs him to run off with her, but fortunately, saner minds prevail. Shinji heads out alone to the heart of the landfill, then jumps onto a mechanical arm claw. Goto follows suit, morphing his legs into something a bit more practical. Oh, my man's got jumps. As Shinji cowers in fear, Goto attacks. Then one of his strikes severs the mechanical arm. They both fall, then square off as the battle prepares to reach its climax. For parasites to survive, humans must perish, Goto says. Shinji spots a weapon, then charges Goto, piercing him with his dirty long rod. Goto shrugs off the strike, then delivers his own. Nani? The strike is blocked, and Migi returns home. That's right, Goto had absorbed him. Yeah! Miki explains that the weapon he stabbed him with was covered in toxins, and now, the other parasites are beginning to revolt too. Barely able to keep things together, Goto takes on a horrifying form. Miki moves in and tells him, this is the end, before striking. This causes Goto to explode, and only his core remains. Somehow, his heart beats on. Sinji reflects that humans may indeed be monsters, but nonetheless, we want to live. He picks up Goto's remains and tosses them into the fire, while Satori watches on. In the end, the parasites represented nature fighting back against mankind. With the backdrop of a landfill, the final battle meets its poetic conclusion. Goto was ultimately defeated by the filth of humanity. But wait, there's more. Migi believes that he's lived out his purpose and wishes to go into deep sleep. Satori and Sinji have adopted Tamiya's son, and Satori ends up getting kidnapped by Yurigami. Yurigami came after Sinji because he noticed he was different. He's come to ask him about his own identity. As a murderer, is he a human or a monster? Before he can answer, Sinji lunges after Satori. Even without Migi, he's still an enhanced human. He successfully disarms and clobbers Yurigami, but just barely misses Satori. She falls towards certain death as Shinji closes his eyes. Suddenly, he gets a weird dream about Migi before finding Satori returned to his grasp. It seems Migi came back for one final heroic act. Arigato.